Welcome back. Our next uh, talk is going to be given by Dr. David Atticon. It's about neonatal hypoglycemia, making sense of different opinions. Dr. Adamkin got his medical degree at the State University of New York Health Science Center at Syracuse in Syracuse, New York. He then um, did his doctorate at Ponzi University, Ponzin, Ponsnan University of Medical Sciences in Ponsnan, Poland. He did his residency in pediatrics at the State University of New York Health Science Center at Syracuse, and then went on to do a fellowship in neonatology at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. He also has some part-time concentrating on teaching in both the U.S. and abroad, and as a president of the Southern Association of Neonatologists and member of the American Pediatric Society. He's a frequent reviewer for medical journals and an avid beachgoer. So without further ado, Dr. David Adamkin. Thank you very much. Let me just correct a little bit. Poznan uh, in Poland is a uh, university uh, medical program that I've had the pleasure of uh, going to probably for close to 20 years now to help uh, with perinatal care there. And I had the, uh, the distinct honor of getting an honoris causa from Poland. So that's my Poland connection. I didn't do any of my uh, medical training there. So thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and to um, discuss with you something that's not rocket science, but is very controversial and very contentious, and that is neonatal hypoglycemia. I had the privilege of writing the AAP document on hypoglycemia, and uh, it was very controversial and continues to get even more so. So I hope I can uh, show you that uh, during my 30 minutes here. Disclosures, I am not a neurologist, nor a developmental pediatrician. My goal is to prevent my patients from needing one. And that's really what this is all about. So I'm gonna talk a lot about normal levels of glucose, and I'm going to contrast the Pediatric Endocrine Society position versus the American Academy of Pediatrics document. And to be honest, we tried to work together and to to be as consistent together as we could, but we do have some some different differing ways of looking at things and I'll I'll try to point those out very objectively. Let me start with postnatal glucose homeostasis. And this was critical in the approach of the academy. The one thing that we wanted to do was to feed babies before we sampled them. And you'll see why in a moment. At the time of delivery, the baby has a blood glucose level that is 70% of mom. In the next hour, at one hour of age, the baby reaches a nadir. And that nadir may be as low as 25 milligrams per deciliter. We really did not want to sample the nadir, which would make things even more confusing in trying to decide on management. During this time, glucagon is surging, mobilizing glycogen, then gluconeogenesis kicks in, feedings begin, and the glucose rises over the first days of life. On this slide is simply shown what happens over the first hours of life. So critical in our approach, feed by one hour of age and not sample until after that feed is complete about a half hour to an hour later. Now, let me walk you through this slide to explain transitional neonatal hypoglycemia, which is absolutely unique and is the first 48 hours of age for every single baby. Let's look at what the slide shows us. On the y-axis are plasma glucose levels. On the x-axis are age in hours, with the most levels being the first 48 hours of life. These are about 50 patients or so. That's what the parentheses are, the number of patients sampled. We're looking at their blood glucose levels over the first week of life. Let's concentrate on the mean 
and the fifth percentile. Again, 70% of the maternal level falls to a nadir, begins to increase. The blue are the fetal glucose concentrations. The red are the maternal glucose concentrations. Now, the mean nadir is about 55 or so. However, the fifth percentile nadir can be as low as 23, 24, 25 milligrams. Over the first week of life, you see the glucose increases. And that after about 72 to 96 hours, the mean glucose becomes very similar to the adult glucose. So this first 48 hours is very unique where the fetal glucose concentration is maintained. And the reason for that is we have hyperinsulinemia for the first 48 hours of life. And then that transitions to an adult standpoint as we get towards 96 hours of age or so. Now, the Pediatric Endocrine Society concentrated on the mean values, and I'll show you why in a moment. The American Academy of Pediatrics, we considered the low ranges for our operational thresholds. An operational threshold is a range of glucose level that we believe to be safe where the clinician makes the decision about what to do. Also taking into account the clinical condition of the baby. And I'll show you that when we look at the AAP document towards the end. Now, here are the adult hormonal responses to hypoglycemia. And this was sentinel to the decisions and recommendations made by the Pediatric Endocrine Society. Let's look at these. These are hormonal adaptations in adults. You see that when the glucose falls below 85 in the adult, insulin is suppressed. As the glucose continues to fall, glucagon surges, epinephrine surges, and other hormonal adaptations take place. The adult is neurogenic between 65 and 70 milligrams of glucose per deciliter, neurogenic. That's gonna be very important for the pediatric endocrine approach. Now, below 50, the adult develops neuroglycopenia. That's a deficiency of glucose in the brain. And these are all the symptoms that the adult would experience now. Let's look at the neonate. Neonatal transitional hypoglycemia, the last slide. Same hormonal adaptations, suppression of insulin, surge of glucagon, surge of epinephrine, but when? 55 to 65. So that for the first 48 hours of life, uniquely in the newborn, that insulin suppression does not occur until 55 to 65. But after 48 hours or so, it becomes just like the adult. So when the endocrinologist looked at this data, they decided that the baby would be neurogenic at 55 to 65, and that should determine what a normal glucose level is. Now, what's clear is we do not know when a newborn becomes neuroglycopenic. We don't have that data. So this represents the PES, the Pediatric Endocrine Society recommendations, zero to 48 hours of glucose above 50, after 48 hours of glucose above 60. And this becomes a little problematic that we're, uh, some of these babies that look awfully well and are doing very well, we don't see that 60 quite that early. And we end up having to do the uh, studies 
uh, on those babies, the fasting studies, to make sure that they don't have a persistent hypoglycemic syndrome. I have more to say about that later. But that's really the key to the pediatric endocrinology group. They did not want us to miss cases of persistent metabolic hypoglycemia. In babies suspected of congenital syndromes or any IV requiring patients, they would like their glucoses above 70. And you saw in the last slide their concerns that at 55 to 65, brain glucose utilization becomes limited in who? The adult. We don't have that data for the newborn. Neurogenic symptoms, 50 to 55, who? The adult. We don't have that for the newborn infant. Neuroglycopenia, below 50, again, we don't have that data for the newborn infant. Now, we see this a little bit differently on the newborn side, that we believe that there are beneficial effects to biochemical hypoglycemia, that the fall in plasma glucose may be important for the development of glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis, stimulation of appetite, adaptation to fast feed cycles. We, we believe that breastfed babies have lower plasma glucoses than formula-fed babies, but have energy sparing because of higher ketone levels. And finally, what really rings important to me is that this first unique 48 hours of this transient hyperinsulinemia is a normal physiologic response that all mammals have the first days of life. Now, 47 became a world standard for a normal glucose level around the world in 1988. It was actually applied to all babies after 1988, including normal breastfeeding babies, babies with no risk factors. 47 became the gospel. Where'd that come from? It was a nutrition study, and the babies were around 30 weeks, 1,337 grams, and they had almost 7,000 samples of glucose done. It was a five-center nutrition study where they're actually looking at different diets and the effect on cognitive outcomes at about a year and a half of age. But they, these babies were having glucoses done during their stay in the NICU and then developmental testing a year and a half later. Let's see what they found. Two thirds of the babies had a glucose less than 47, ranging from three to 30 days. Reduced developmental scores were associated with the number of days that the glucose level was less than 47. Since glucose levels were not a primary target of this study, a number of the babies had glucose levels less than 20 for five days because there was no intervention. As it turned out, at seven to eight years of age, the investigators wrote a letter to Lancet saying that these babies actually look pretty good, that this appeared to be a transient phenomenon, and actually agreed that this was probably not the most optimal method to go about trying to discover the level of glucose below which injury occurred. Let me also mention that this size baby is not on the AAP document. We assume that babies this size would be in the NICU, and they'd be having glucose levels done. We weren't going to prescribe uh, recommendations for these babies. We were having enough problems trying to prescribe recommendations for babies greater than 35 weeks and those term babies with risk factors. Now, a number of years later, also in the United Kingdom, another study was done by Win 10. And this compared the neurodevelopmental outcome, again, of babies less than 32 weeks who had frequent glucose levels less than 47, the first 10 days of life versus matched controls. So daily glucose, first 10 days, the index cases were those babies 
who had three days less than 47 during the first 10 days of life. The controls, all of their levels were greater than 47. And you see 47 of 566 became index cases. They were less than 47. What they find? At two years of age, no difference in any of the mean Griffith's developmental quotients of 47 matched pairs. The index case for less than 47, three days, the controls all greater than 47. No difference at two years of age in any of these developmental quotients that you see on the slide. Now, uniquely, they had an 81% follow-up of these children at 15 to 16 years of age. That's really the data that we need and that we suffer from not having, you'll see as we continue this discussion. But at 15 to 16 years of age, no difference, full-scale IQ, reading, behavior, cerebral palsy, and so on. No difference for less than 47 versus greater than 47. Same country. Now, let's move up 2012, and we're going to see a, a number of studies from the group in New Zealand that are doing the most work uh, in hypoglycemia. And uh, this is one of their first studies that educated us on risk and the different levels that we see related to the risk factors. So the at-risk groups are SGAs, IDMs, LGAs, and late preterm. And that matches up exactly with the same risk groups for the AAP. Less than 2,500 grams SGA, greater than 4,500 grams LGA. It turns out that about 25% of all deliveries will be in that risk group category. They did plasma glucoses before feeds. They did glucose oxidase levels. So these are real laboratory levels, not point of care. The sugar baby study was going on at the same time with the dextrose gel. And I'm going to talk about that at the end. So that was uh, babies were getting gel as well in this study. And they also got expressed milk from women who were going to uh, who had diabetes that were going to deliver IDMs so they could be very aggressive with the gel and milk obtained prior to delivery to do everything they could to keep the glucose above 47. Let's see what they found. 514 babies, half of them had glucoses above 47 and half had glucoses below 47. What does that mean? It means that 12 and a half percent of all newborns have a low glucose concentration if you use 47. Extrapolate that to the United States, that's over half a million babies a year would be diagnosed with hypoglycemia if we used 47. About 10% of babies admitted to the NICU, a cost of about $2 billion a year. Now, something that we have really learned a lot from and also comes from New Zealand is the continuous interstitial glucose monitoring where you get a glucose every five minutes. Let's look what we first learned from that device, 2010. It turns out that low glucose concentrations are much more common than clinically recognized when you use continuous glucose monitoring versus intermittent sampling. 19% of episodes less than 47 were picked up on intermittent sampling. 81% were not detected by plasma sampling. 81% were picked up only with continuous glucose monitoring. So they say that low glucose concentrations uh, occur in normal newborns and the physiologic importance of undetected low glucose, uh, continuous glucose monitoring is unknown. And I'll have more to say about that with a couple of new studies just published this year. So I've had this slide for a long time, but I changed what the baby says. 
the baby's saying, do you really know how many times my blood glucose went below 47? And the answer used to be no. Well, the answer now is yes. And the answer is a lot when you use continuous glucose monitoring. And now the baby I've added to it is going to say, wait until you see the GLOW study. We're going to see that in a few moments. So I had labeled this a number of years ago as I was working on this document, quadragenta septum phobia, the fear of 47, profoundly influenced neonatal care. And that came from my roots working with Frank Oski, who coined the vagintophobia, the fear of 20 with hyperbilirubinemia. So study just published, my friends Kelly Wade in Philadelphia, and what makes this even more impactful for me is that Philadelphia is one of the main sites for the pediatric endocrinology work and pediatric endocrine society individuals who uh, generated the uh, document that I showed you earlier from their society. So this was a retrospective study of well-appearing but at-risk babies, greater than 36 weeks, had a glucose by 72 hours of age, and they used the endocrinology less than 50, was the cutoff for hypoglycemia. Uh, over 10,000 eligible patients, half, almost half, were screened. Why is that? Remember earlier I showed you that about 25% in the states are screened or in using the AAP risk factors or the New Zealand risk factors, 25% would be screened. Well, the Pediatric Endocrine Society recommendations have a number of other babies that are screened by their protocol. And it, in this study, it led to almost half of the deliveries being screened for hypoglycemia. So a blood glucose less than 50 occurred in 43%, with about 5% going to the NICU. Let's apply those numbers to the United States. That means 850,000 babies would be diagnosed with hypoglycemia if you use the blood glucose of 50. What they found was using the, the less than 50 was associated with lower rates of exclusive breastfeeding, 22% versus 65% when you use a blood glucose of 50. Late preterms were most frequently classified as hypoglycemic. And their conclusion was they didn't like all of the babies being screened uh, because of its impact on breastfeeding so that the risks and benefits of screening needed to be urgently addressed. Okay, let's look at the GLOW study, also just published and actually comes from our friends in New Zealand. It's a prospective mass observational studies. These are healthy term AGA babies. These are not at risk. These are healthy term AGA babies. They got both continuous glucose monitoring and repeated heel prick plasma uh, oxidase method. So laboratory glucoses for the first 24 hours and twice a day till five days. The babies were between 2000, would care for between 2015, 2017. 47, the gold standard in New Zealand defined hypoglycemia. 67 babies term 40 weeks. The mean plasma glucose increased the first 18 hours and remained stable to 48 hours at around 60. That's a bit more robust than we see in a lot of our uh, literature for a uh, mean plasma glucose. Increased to a new plateau by the fourth day of life of about 90. So that would be a good time to be investigating babies that have had low glucose levels that you're concerned about could be a persistent hypoglycemic syndrome and would need the fasting uh, study and then would need further workup with your pediatric endocrinologist. Plasma glucose of 47 approximated the 10th percentile the first 48 hours. 39% of healthy term babies, the first five days of life, had at least one episode less than 47. Early term babies had lower mean glu glucoses than those greater than 38 weeks and were more likely to have episodes less than 47. 
So 59% versus 20% or a relative risk of three times more for early term. Continuous glucose monitoring showed more frequent and severe low glucose than intermittent. 25% on continuous glucose monitoring had greater than one episode, less than 36. 36 is what the New Zealanders use to define severe hypoglycemia. Again, you're talking about well term babies, no risk, one fourth on continuous monitoring. According to New Zealand's definition of severe hypoglycemia, have severe hypoglycemia. Healthy infants complete metabolic transition by day four. Many healthy term infants have glucose levels below accepted thresholds for treatment of hypoglycemia. Child is the name of the group in New Zealand doing all of this elegant work, children with hypoglycemia and later development. Now, they had showed in a number of their studies that babies with risk factors who developed a glucose less than 47, while they did not have increased neurosensory impairment, they had an increased risk of poor executive and visual motor function at four and a half years of age. And that's very, very concerning because uh, poor executive function may imply poor outcome, school, and so on. So we need longer-term follow-up. However, they're unable, unable to determine if these similar levels that we're seeing in healthy-term babies may be associated with similar impairments. That would be very scary if that's the case. I don't believe that's the case, but uh, that's what this is telling us. Let's look at a editorial from Keith Barrington about the GLOW study. Puts it all together for us. One third of healthy babies had at least one plasma glucose less than 47 when you use that as the gold standard. Continuous glucose monitoring showed over 50% were hypoglycemic at some point. The lower limit of normal plasma glucose doesn't start to increase until about 48 hours of age. That's the transitional neonatal hypoglycemic that we talked about. Now, if you take these levels and compare them to the thresholds from various learned societies, you discover some recommendations lead to a majority of healthy babies being defined as hypoglycemic and would be treated. Let's look at that. Here are the number of healthy, no-risk infants with glucose levels below recommended thresholds for treatment. So here's the AAP, the British, the World Health Organization, the Pediatric Endocrine Society. In the numerator is the plasma level. In the denominator is the continuous glucose monitoring. WHO, 18% by plasma, 38% by continuous monitoring of healthy, well babies would be diagnosed with hypoglycemia. Four to 24 hours, 24 and 63%. Pediatric endocrine society, zero to four hours, 25% by plasma, half by continuous glucose monitoring would be treated for hypoglycemia. 40%, 73%, four to 24 hours. Let's jump up to the AAP and we see zero to four hours, none, four to 24 hours, 3% by plasma, 11% by continuous glucose monitoring, 24 to 48 hours, 1% and 5%. So the questions are, is hypoglycemia more damaging to at risk than the remainder? Hyperinsulinemia interferes with ketone body production and low substrate glycogen stores, but most babies with hypoglycemia do not produce ketones. Screening at risk babies is a strategy 
to find babies more likely to have a low blood sugar, not because they're more likely to have long-term adverse outcomes. If you compare the incidence of hypoglycemia in GLOW versus at-risk babies, there isn't much difference. Let me show you that very quickly. Less than 47, the gold standard. Less than 36, actually the AAP, four hour to 24 hour low operational threshold. Less than 27, the AAP treatment for the first four hours. Here's plasma glucose, healthy versus at risk. Healthy, 39% would be screened versus 49% of at risk. A difference of only 10%. By interstitial glucose, 68% of healthy would be screened. At risk, 75%. Less than 36, by plasma, 10% of healthy, 15% of at risk, so on and so forth. There isn't much difference as to who would be screened, whether you're healthy or an at-risk baby using these values. So finding the critical level for glucose and neurodevelopmental outcome, we have, a, again, another study from this year called the HypoExit trial, a multi-center randomized non-inferiority trial that's going to compare keeping the glucose greater than 36 versus keeping the glucose greater than 47. That's what's being tested here, moderate hypoglycemia. 689 babies randomized to low, keep the glucose above 36. 341 babies randomized to keep the glucose above 47. Let's see what they found. No difference in cognitive scores, no difference in motor scores, and an inferiority margin had to be greater than minus 7.5 to mean that the lower threshold was inferior to the traditional threshold, and none of them came close. And this is for each risk category, preterm, SGA, LJ, and IDM. So no differences. Secondary outcomes, fewer glucose measured with the lower threshold group at 10% less. The number to treat to save one newborn with the lower threshold from IV glucose was seven, from getting tube fed was 12, and from getting supplemental oral feeding was five. So in healthy newborns with asymptomatic, moderate neonatal hypoglycemia, the lower glucose threshold was non-inferior to traditional at 18 months. Again, we need longer term studies. Here is the AAP document that I think you're, you're all familiar with. This was actually published in 2011, was reaffirmed in 2016, the same risk categories you've seen. And uh, since we're getting uh, close on time here, I'd be happy to take any questions on this, but I think most folks are familiar uh, with this. There's also a sugar wheel that you can get on your phone, which tells you what to do by hour of age, depending on the blood sugar. We wrote a, a editorial in 2016 to try and fill in for 24 to 48 hours. The AAP covered the first 24 hours, and then the endocrines were really interested in not missing persistent cases, so they picked things up about after 72 hours. So we filled in just with expert advice what to do between 24 to 48 hours, and we chose the glucose should be greater than 45, and the reasons are shown on the slide. Let me finish up with dextrose gel. This shows a baby receiving the dextrose gel into the buccal cavity, massage for a few seconds, a very uh, good new therapy. This is the sugar baby study, which showed that it works. Babies less than 48 hours of age receive uh, the 40% gel, 200 per kilo versus placebo. Again, 47 being used, this comes out of New Zealand. A treatment failure was less than 47 after two treatments. Uh, consistent, 40, half are hypoglycemic. The dexose gel reduced treatment failure, 14% versus 29%. So by treating eight babies, you can keep one out of the NICU, and they recommend the treatment. I am going to go ahead and skip over 
uh, this one to try and stay closer on time. And on one of my trips to Poland, uh, these glucose bottles were in my hotel room, had to take a picture of them. You're used, you're supposed to use those if you're inebriated. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions. Let me stop sharing and exit. There we go. And I'm back. Thank you. Good. So we much. okay? Good. Right now, we're going to get some questions from attendees. So, again, guys, if you could go over on the right hand side, click the word stage, and there should open a chat box. And if you'll just type your questions in there, um, I'll read them to Dr. Adamkin, and that way he can answer them as we go. Um, we need to give them a few minutes while okay. people are typing. So while we wait on some people to type in their questions, um, Dr. Adamkin, what first got you interested in neonatal nutrition? Because I know this has been a passion of yours for a long time. Oh, that, that's an interesting story. When I went to um, did my residency at Syracuse, um, I was very interested in hematology and immunology. And I thought that's what I was going to do. When I first started on the faculty at U of L, we really had no research money, and a company came and asked us if we would do a study on intravenous lipids. And I said, "Well, does it pay?" And they said, "Yeah, we'll we'll give you a grant." And that's how it got started. Okay. Well, our first <laughs> question: <laughs> best laid plans. Look, you never know. <laughs> um, what was the app you were talking about? Uh, that was from Ann Mackey. Oh, yeah, it's the Sugar Wheel. If you go on your phone you should be able to find that, the sugar wheel. And uh, if you put in the hour of age uh, and the glucose, it'll tell you what the recommendation is from the AAP. Let me also tell you that that's now been going for nine years. It was published in 2011. It was reaffirmed in 2016. And it's finally going to be uh, changed a little bit because of the uh, dextrose gel and so on and so forth. So I know we will have a new pediatric um, or neonatal statement from the Committee on Fetus and Newborn, hopefully in the near future. And I've been chatting with them a little bit about some of the changes that could be made. Okay, and for the sake of time, I'm gonna tell everybody that we have a break coming up. We'll, we will reconvene at 3.15 Currently, during that time, the Expo Center is open and the scavenger hunt is open. So go and take a look and kind of find your emoji so you can hopefully win a gift card at the end. So we're going to have a break and we will reconvene promptly at 315. Thank you very much.